Hello everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Implementation of Dried Blood Spots, DBS, for Hepatitis C, HCV Elimination. I'm Alexis Kraus of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labberts and brought to you by Abbott Molecular Global Scientific Affairs. To learn more, please visit abbottmolecular.com. Now, let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Support for this program is provided by Abbott and our speakers today are presenting at the request of Abbott. I'd like to now present today's speakers, Dr. Lisa Matro, Emmanuel Fajardo, and Dr. Tim Meehan. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Our speakers will now begin their presentations. Good afternoon. I'm Alisa Matro from German Strias y Pujol Hospital and Research Institute in Spain. And I'd like to thank Abbott for inviting me to participate in this webinar. I'll be talking to you about HIV diagnosis and elimination programs with the role of dry blood spots. So I'll start with a, a little bit of a, a background on hepatitis C, the global elimination strategy, and then about diagnosis and the possibilities and our experience with DBS. So let's start with the background. So hepatitis C virus is a small envelope virus with RNA genome discovered in 1989 that infects the liver causing hepatitis. While acute hepatitis C is generally mild and can be spontaneously cleared by your immune response, most infected people will develop a chronic hepatitis C which is often undiagnosed because symptoms may develop decades after infection due to advanced liver disease, which is associated with cirrhosis or liver cancer. Globally, hepatitis C is a global health problem with over 70 million people with chronic hepatitis C. And due to shared modes of transmission with HIV, mainly through exposure to infected blood, HCV is also a major cause of morbidity and mortality in people living with HIV globally. Over the last years, um, several direct acting antivirals have been developed that when used in combination can cure hepatitis C in almost all patients with short, well-tolerated oral regime. However, access to diagnosis and treatment is low. So how can we uh, eliminate this global health problem? Well, mortality by viral hepatitis, and especially hepatitis C, has been increasing and even surpasses that by other relevant infection diseases in the world. So having an effective treatment, this cannot be allowed anymore. So in 2016, the WHO launched the first global strategy on viral hepatitis for their elimination as a public health threat by 2030. This means achieving a 90% reduction in new cases and 65% reduction in mortality. And how can we achieve this? Well, we need to uh, um, uh, perform a massive scale-up in diagnosis and treatment from 2015 baseline to 2030 targets of 90% and 80% respectively. Since, as you can see in this cascade of care, hepatitis C is mostly undiagnosed and untreated worldwide. 
but elimination targets are proving hard to achieve, as you can see in this study, in which many countries are off track and by many years to achieve elimination. And while uh, predictions have uh, been optimistic in Spain since the approval of our national plan against hepatitis C in 2015, we still need to maintain a high diagnosis and treatment rate each year in order to achieve elimination. So there are several um, populations that are especially vulnerable to HIV infection. You can see them in this box. And for a variety of reasons, they tend to have limited access to healthcare services. That's why WHO and ECDC testing guidelines stress that we need uh, simplified diagnosis tests and algorithms to expand screening out of the healthcare setting and into the community. This has been taken into account by our regional plan against hepatitis C in Catalonia, to which I've had the pleasure to contribute. So we need to develop new patient-centered models of testing and care, ideally offering uh, HIV diagnosis and treatment within those services that these uh, populations are already accessing within the community. And the design of specific strategies, um, specifically uh, taking into account the needs of each one of these populations, can lead to what it's called microelimination in each of them. So now I'll talk a little bit on diagnosis. Upon infection, HIV RNA is the first marker to become detectable. And in acute infection, as I, as I said that it may uh, be spontaneously cleared, this RNA will become undetectable. While the antibody response generated against the virus will generally be detectable for the lifetime. However, most infected individuals will go on to develop a chronic infection. In this case, HIV RNA will persist beyond the first six months of infection. That's why uh, the conventional um, diagnostic algorithm of hepatitis C relies in two steps. First of all, we perform a serological test to detect HIV antibodies, and this will tell us if that person has been infected with the virus. If positive, we need to go on and perform a second test, confirmatory test, detecting HIV RNA in order to uh, determine if this person has a viremic infection and is in need of treatment. This, these two tests are um, conventionally performed in two different uh, samples of venipuncture blood, and this causes uh, losses to follow up in, in the, um, the two-step algorithm. This may be simplified by performing both tests from the same venipuncture blood sample. But still, uh, diagnosis of hepatitis C requires uh, multiple visits to healthcare centers, the use of venipuncture, and fresh blood requires uh, certain uh, conditions for storage and shipment to the laboratory, including cold chain. So that's why over the last few years, new diagnostic strategies have been designed in order to um, bring diagnosis closer to affected people. In this sense, dried blood spots, which are an alternative minimally invasive specimen, have proved very useful. And it may also facilitate the, the simplification of the diagnosis algorithm, as we said, performing reflex testing on the same sample, or even performing direct RNA testing in this, what we call one-step testing, or even facilitate the, the introduction of new screening strategies such as home sampling or integrated multi-testing screening and facilitate decentralization not only of diagnosis but also treatment monitoring. So dry blood spots are a few drops of capillary blood that are collected and let dry onto a special paper card. We actually like to measure the appropriate uh, volume of blood, and we use these mini-vets or EDTA capillaries 
in order to do it, but you could also uh, directly transfer the drops of blood into the uh, paper card that we use, uh, Watman card, but without touching it with the skin, as this could lead to deterioration of the sample. So the most important thing is that the blood needs to be completely dry before storage, and we store it with a desiccant. We use one with a humidity indicator for uh, quality purposes. And then they, uh, the samples are stable and can be shipped to the laboratory through regular email. We have these uh, small instructions for collection centers. So the use of bright blood spots has um, the support from testing guidelines and being such a minimally invasive uh, sample that is easy to collect, they provide virtually universal access to diagnosis because they can be even collected by health, uh, not healthcare workers, but community workers. And uh, they can be shipped uh, uh, from temperature to the laboratory, and they are good for the detection of both antibodies and RNA, and even tests for other bloodborne viruses. On the other hand, of course, we are using a very low uh, volume of blood, and then the sensitivity may be somewhat lower than in plasma for the detection of the viral RNA. The um, instructions need to be carefully followed in order to ensure the stability and the quality of the sample. And uh, until now, uh, testing has been mostly performed in specialized labs because of the lack of uh, the limited availability of commercial assays with regulatory approval for the use of DBS samples. Of course, this is not a rapid test, so results need to be delivered at the second visit. As you can see in this meta-analysis, um, the detection of HCV RNA from DBA shows a very high um, diagnostic precision when we look at both commercial and in-house assays. And uh, there has been a concern regarding the sensitivity of these alternative uh, assays, but we have to make such an effort to reach uh, 2030 targets with 90% of diagnosed people that the WHO has uh, deemed suitable all those tests that are able to improve access and or affordability that at least can detect uh, 3,000 international units per ml. Um, the European clinical guidelines talk about 1,000, and these level, levels of arrhenia can be detected in um, 95 to 97% of all chronic infections. You have to bear in mind that unless we use these alternative testing methods, many people worldwide will not have access to conventional diagnosis of hepatitis C. So in our experience, uh, back in, in 2015, we set up an in-house qualitative real-time PCR assay for the detection of hepatitis C and an internal control. We validated in, in our lab with um, hepatology patients in, in our outpatient visit in our hospital. And it showed very high sensitivity and specificity, as you can see in this more recent meta-analysis. And later on, we performed a real-world validation in people who inject drugs, showing as well a good um, sensitivity and specificity when considering the limits established by the WHO and compared to the viral load testing in plasma. The assay design is based on previous methods developed in Scotland by uh, Bennett et al. But we use some modifications in order to simplify the process. So we perform a single step retrotranscription and real time PCR, and we use a commercial uh, internal control. So basically, we punch out two spots. Uh, we use uh, this first kind of uh, puncher that we sterilize by flaming in between samples. Some other uh, tools or even scissors can be used. And then we elude the, the blood from the paper guard by um, incubation with a lysis buffer and um, orbital uh, shaker. Then we go on and perform automatic RNA extraction. The PCR setup is performed manually. 
and then uh, finally we do the amplification and detection in a single step for both the hepatitis C RNA and an internal control that is an unrelated RNA that we add to each sample in order to monitor the whole process. We also use positive and negative controls in each run. So how do we use this test? Um, in intermediate prevalence populations that attend community centers, we recommend to first use an antibody uh, rapid test for instance in oral fluid or capillary blood, and if positive, right away we can collect the DBS sample. While in high prevalence populations, we do the one-step RNA testing since prevalence, in, for instance, in people who inject drugs may have reached 90%, so it's no, no use on using an antibody test first. So we directly collect um, the DBS sample and in both cases, we uh, ship these samples at room temperature to the laboratory for HCV RNA testing, and results are given back to the community center. So I'll show you some examples of each of these two strategies. In our first project uh, with DBS, we screen men who have sex with men and sexual workers attending an NGO in Barcelona. And uh, we trained the community workers uh, at this NGO in HCV testing, counseling, and, and DBS collection. And we showed that both tests uh, had very high acceptability. And while uh, HCV prevalence was similar to that in the general population, which is below 1% in Spain, uh, based on this and a uh, uh, couple of other studies, um, last year, uh, this protocol uh, of community screening of hepatitis C in HIV-negative um, men who have sex with men and transgender women was uh, implemented in, as part of our regional plan. Also, um, migrants from endemic countries for hepatitis C will need to be screened. And we developed this Epsilink project, which is a microelimination pilot in Pakistani immigrants in Barcelona. So what we did, we trained uh, community health agents in hepatitis C screening and counseling, and then they perform uh, community events in which they uh, use um, an interactive educational tool and perform on-site screening with rapid antibody testing, and if positive, they collect the DBS sample for the confirmation of the viral RNA. This way, we are able to um, provide simplified uh, linkage to care and treatment for viremic patients needing uh, the, the antiviral treatment. And this, this project is being also um, now uh, expanded to hepatitis B and also uh, people from other endemic countries. And as part of the original plan is also uh, implemented in other areas in Catalonia. Then uh, the EPSI Detective Project, uh, we perform in people who actively inject drugs. We set up uh, DVS testing in form ha for harm reduction services in the Barcelona province. And we demonstrated the feasibility of DVS collection by the harm reduction center staff, including also one mobile unit. And as we said before, uh, we uh, demonstrated a high reliability of the test in real world conditions. And this enabled us to determine for the first time the prevalence of viremic infection in this, in this population in, in our setting. And uh, also among viremic patients, 35% were not aware of their status. These results were published last year and included in this compilation of new models of care for drug services. Also in people who inject drugs, we compared the uh, usefulness and, and reliability of our DVS test with a rapid or uh, point of care test detecting uh, HIV RNA by GeneXpert platform. And as you can see here, uh, when taking into consideration 
the limits established by the WHO, we demonstrated that both alternative tests are highly reliable and they will enable to uh, also uh, facilitate decentralized um, not only diagnosis but treatment and we're collaborating in this microelimination project with the hospital clinic. So uh, very recently uh, within our original plan, uh, this protocol has been approved in which um, these alternative testing strategies will be offered to people who use drugs. So in conclusion, simplified HCV RNA detectant strategies based on GBS facilitate access to diagnosis and self-knowledge of viremic infection in a simple and reliable way as long as quality can be assured. And they can help decentralize not only diagnosis, but also treatment and monitoring of reinfection, as, as suggested initially by John Dillon. And its implementation will help meet elimination targets, not only improving uh, the diagnosis rate, but also monitoring the epidemics, as we also use it to estimate the, cas the cascade of care in people who inject drugs. Obviously, uh, this has been an effort of a multidisciplinary collaboration, and I'd like to thank all the involved people who made this possible, and also funding sources. And of course, thank you for your attention. So now I will pass it to the next speaker. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everybody. This is Emmanuel Fajardo. I'm working with SIND in the hepatitis program, and I'm very delighted today to share some of the results uh, of our study uh, to evaluate dry blood spots for RNA testing. So thank you to all the participants who are joining this webinar. Uh, so today I will walk you through some of the uh, outcomes of this study. I'll show you the background, the methodology, and the results for the Abbott uh, DBS RNA testing. Uh, so, as previously mentioned by the speakers, there are many challenges in trying to reach all those people who are infected with hepatitis C. This graph is from the WHO report in 2018 highlighting that there is a high proportion of, of, of people infected with HCV who aren't aware of their status. And there are many reasons for this. One is that the many countries, they lack the policies to support testing. Uh, but also one of the main critical issues is really the, the laboratory capacity, but also the complexity to diagnose hepatitis C. So unlike HIV for hepatitis, we need, in addition to the antibody testing, we need a viral load to be able to confirm active infection or viremia. Unfortunately, the gold standard to uh, determine viremic is, uh, relies on plasma, uh, usually in centralized labs. And as mentioned before, there are many uh, programmatic issues uh, one of those is really the sample referral networks, especially in low middle income countries, where you need a cold chain to transport all these plasma samples. You also need some centrifuges to, to get the plasma. Okay, so you do require some resources. So this is very challenging in many countries. But uh, over the last decade, there have been a lot of the system strengthening or laboratory strengthening in many countries. And uh, there are platforms already in place uh, uh, nucleic acid testing platforms that are also used for other diseases. So, of course, this offers a very good opportunity for integration uh, uh, among the different diseases. So, in order to overcome the issues with the sample transportation of plasma, the dry blood spot has been identified already for many years as a very practical option to, to collect this sample and, and conduct not only RNA testing, but for other testing like, as antibody testing or resistance testing. So uh, it offers a lot of uh, practical uh, uh, benefits uh, because you decentralize sample collection. And this is very important from a patient perspective because sometimes when the transport system is very poor in many, in many countries, then the patient has to come again to the clinic 
to match with the with the with the sample with the transport schedule. So the decentralizing sample collection is, is a, it does help in avoiding dropouts of patients. And of course, as you get rid of the cold chain, the reduction in prices will also be important. Um, there is already, as mentioned before, there is some studies that have shown that uh, using dry blood spot for RNA testing is highly accurate. And this graph in your left shows the, the, the summary of the studies uh, as part of the meta-analysis, uh, uh, where they look at the performance of DBS for RNA testing. And the pool sensitivity was 98%, and the specificity was also very high. This is really good. But at the same time, many of these studies have some shortcomings because uh, they use a variety of different technologies, mainly use in-house uh, methods. There, are, there were also commercial methods, but the, the, the procedure to test the DBS uh, are not standardized in these, process, in these studies. So for example, the number of the spots or the, or the volume of blood that you put in filter paper, it, it just varies a lot. Uh, so, you know, most of the this study use uh, uh, methods that are off label, so it means the manufacturers have not validated it. And, and also, most of the studies have been carried out in central labs, you know, usually in reference lab universities. Uh, so, there is a lack of uh, performance studies in real life. So, that's why with this study, find is intending to try to answer some of the questions in, in terms of the performance of the dry blood spots compared to plasma using finger prick or venous blood. Uh, we also, as part of this multi-century study, we are also evaluating other technologies that are commonly used for HIV, for hepatitis C and HIV, of course, which include the Roche and the Hologic, but the results of this uh, uh, will not be shared today. So the, the number of sites that participated in this multi-country study are four. So you see here in the map, it's Cameroon, it's Greece, Georgia, and Rwanda. So we try to have a very diversified geographical representation. Uh, and these sites uh, in all these countries, the ABOT was already uh, implemented. Uh, Australia acted as a reference lab, so we sent all the dry blood spots to Australia for further testing. These are the different platforms that are part of this study with the ABOT, with the M2000 sample preparation system, and we use only DBS. All countries, Cameroon, Georgia, Greece, and Rwanda, they, they, they have this system. While for Roche and for Hologic, it was done only in Australia. So we ship all the samples to, to Australia for their testing. Then the, the, the people who participated in this study, the recruitment strategy was that we identified three distinct groups. So one was people who have uh, a, a, who are antibody positive for hepatitis C. Also people who are at risk of hepatitis C, so with some risk factors, like people who inject drugs or people, or people with tattoos, MSM, HIV positive, et cetera. And also uh, people who have already been exposed to, to the treatment or to DAAs. This slide shows you a little bit of the sample workflow. It looks a little bit busy, but it's basically every participant, a, couple, a finger prick was conducted and all the filter papers then were completed. Um, and also the, the venous blood was collected in the EDTA, EDTA, and then it was centrifuged to get plasma, and of course also to conduct the, the, the testing. Um, in these countries, um, the, the people who carried out this sample collection differed. So for example, in Cameroon, it was mainly the lab technicians. In Georgia, it was the, the nurses, and in Greece, it was actually the physicians. So we collected, uh, for example, for the finger prick, we did use a volumetric uh, uh, kind of pipette uh, to be able to measure the 70 microliters of blood that is recommended for filter paper. We follow a standard procedure uh, for all sites, um, and then we tried also to uh, keep the DBS at room temperature until testing so that it mimics a real life situation. Then after all these procedures, we proceed to do the ab testing with the, with the protocol provided by, by the company. 
which is the open mode protocol for DBS. Here in this slide is showing um, uh, the results, uh, the turnaround time from blood collection to RNA testing. So this box plot shows you the median time, you know, in terms of the days in the y-axis. It shows you the days, and the, in, in the in the x-axis is the different type of tests: so plasma, DBS capillary, DBS venous blood. And you will see, for example, that in, in Greece, they, they tested very quickly within a week or a, in a medium of 10 days, they were already doing all the testing, and the same in Georgia. Well, for Cameroon, there were some delays, so the turnaround time was extended. In all sites, as I said before, we tried to keep the dry blood spots uh, at room temperature, but because of the extended timeline, we had to uh, resort to, you know, to use cold chain so that degradation of RNA did not take place. Uh, these are the results of the demographics. And, uh, so I will not describe them all in detail, but just wanted to highlight, uh, uh, for example, that in all countries, uh, most of the participants were male, except in Cameroon, that uh, we have 58% of the participants who were women. Also, uh, uh, the number of people uh, infected with HIV was rather low, so we only have 3% of participants with HIV co-infection. Um, and also, the number of people exposed to treatment was uh, was only 13%, so almost 100, 100 participants have been exposed to DAAs. In this slide, I'm showing the distribution of the genotypes across the countries. You will see there the total. And in general, genotype 1 was the most uh, common uh, genotype for what 4 and 3. Also, uh, as part of this study, we also wanted to evaluate uh, you know, the, the sensitivity of dry blood spot to detect all these genotypes. So in this graph, it's showing the sensitivity across all genotypes for, for venous blood, DBS, and for capillary. So we detected all the genotypes. In this slide, uh, I'm showing the results of capillary, DBS, across the three countries. Uh, I did not mention that Rwanda is still ongoing, so I, uh, we don't have results here. So it's only for these countries. So here you show, you can see the distribution of viral loads by the sample type, and you see that it's very similar between plasma and TBS. But in general, the dry blood spots tended to be lower compared to plasma, which is expected uh, as the, the volume of blood is much lower. But interestingly, in Cameroon, we found that uh, the, the, actually the viral load in the dry blood spot was a little bit higher than a uh, plasma. Um, we could be, you know, we think maybe it has something to do with the correction factor. But overall, if they were, the, 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 the distribution of viral load is very similar to, to plasma. In this slide, I'm showing the correlation uh, uh, between the, the DPS uh, capillary and the plasma. And you can see that there is a strong linear correlation between both samples. And also in your, in your right, in the graph of the right, you see the, the difference between DPS and plasma. And the mean difference was 0.2 log. So it means 0.2 log plasma was reading 0.2 log a little bit higher than DPS. Uh, then we conducted the sensitivity and specificity analysis, which is, which is the primary endpoint of this evaluation. So here in this slide, I'm showing the, the results by country on the top and, and below with the pool sensitivity and specificity. So you can see there, for example, that the sensitivity in Georgia and Cameroon was kind of similar, 99%, 95%, but it was reduced slightly in Greece. It was 90%. Specificity was high, 95%, 100% in the sense of grace, and the invalid rate was very low. So when we try to compare the results between Georgia and Cameroon, we see they're not statistically significant, but they were significant between Georgia and Greece in, in terms of sensitivity. That means 99% versus 90%. Um, in the next slide, I'm showing then the results for the venous blood, so collected with EDTA whole blood and spotted on the filter paper. 
So again, the results are very similar, very strong a linear correlation between plasma and the venous blood. And the same, the difference between plasma also was 0 .0, 0 0.1 log in, in general. And most of the, the results, the difference was below the 0 0.5 log. These are the, the results of the sensitivity and specificity for the venous BBS. So the results are exactly very, very similar to the capillary one, with the same trend in terms of grease, uh, showing a little reduced sensitivity. Uh, and the overall, but overall, all sites, you can see that the sensitivity is 95% and specificity is 97%, while also having a very low invalid rate. Uh, this is the distribution of the uh, viral loads by sample type of venous blood and plasma, so similar to capillary. Uh, as mentioned before, um, sorry, as mentioned before, the the viral load tended to be a little bit lower in in the venous DBS in Georgia and in, and in Greece, but it is slightly higher in Cameroon. We also conducted the analysis according to the population groups. As I mentioned before, we had three distinct groups that were recruited, those seropositive, at risk, and people on treatment. And you can see that the sensitivity for and specificity for those of seropositive and high risk was quite good. But for people on treatment, it was reduced. It was only 65% sensitivity. And of course, you would expect that all these patients have a much lower bar load. Uh, uh, so basically, it means that of the 92 participants that have received treatment, DBS detected only 13 out of the 20. So there were seven false negatives. To, so to go further in detail, to look at, do, at those seven false negatives, you can see here the respective plasma concentration and the DBS that came undetected. And of course, the concentration in plasma is very low, so it's usually quantifiable, but under the limit of detection of the assay. So it was most of the four results, and they tended to be very, very low. Interestingly, there was a, a DBS was able to, um, to detect RNA in samples as low as the 600 range. So here, the discussion around the threshold to, uh, to use for DBS to evaluate the performance becomes quite important. So as mentioned previously in the, in the first uh, talk, uh, you know, the, the ESO guidelines, the, the European Association uh, for the Study of the Liver, they recommend a 1,000 threshold for settings where access to a VAR load is limited. Uh, uh, here, I'm also putting the, the limit of detection of, of the Abbott DBS method, which is 462. So, um, uh, to, to further elaborate on that, in this graph, I'm showing, sorry, it's a little bit busy, but basically, I'm highlighting here this is the bar low distribution in my, among all those patients on treatment. Uh, so, more than 65% of the participants had actually very high bar loads. So the median the bar load was 5.6 log uh, in DBS or with plasma, uh, meaning that you could still detect uh, uh, those uh, participants who were already exposed to DAAs. So just as a conclusion of this study, uh, so uh, uh, the study confirms that the performance of the DBS is very good, is very high, and you can still use either capillary or venous blood um, compared to the gold standard. When we compare uh, our, the sensitivity of, of this study with the pool sensitivity is very similar, and actually it overlaps with the confidence intervals of the pool sensitivity and the same for for the specificity. So, uh, yeah, we confirm it's good performance. Uh, however, we did see the variability, right, between, for example, Greece and the other side that had a lower sensitivity. And the GPS, uh, you know, is still, because it's a different sample type, it's, it's subject to some kind of variability in terms of repetition. You repeat the test, it will give you a slightly different result. And this difference could be in the range of 0 0.25 log difference which is normal according to the sample type. 
Also, another um, consideration or finding is, for example, the specificity of the DBS in the in, in the group of participants that were a treatment experience was 100%. Meaning that if you use DBS for SVR, all those people who are undetected, they will be correctly identified as undetected. So confirming the cure. However, you know, whether DBS would be useful to identify patients who are failing treatment and who are experiencing a low level of viremia need to be uh, further analyzed. And the threshold, the, 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 the clinical threshold to be used for this needs to be established. So uh, I think this is the end of my presentation. Of course, this work was a great collaboration between different partners. And I would like to thank all the participants in the different countries who decided to participate in the different uh, partners that collaborated with this study. Thank you also to Abbott for the invitation and, and then I hand over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the previous speakers, my colleagues, as well as to Abbott for the opportunity to present today. I'm going to be discussing the potential to increase the access to HCV testing in low to middle income countries through the use of dried blood spot. Uh, my name is Timothy Meehan, uh, and I work for Clinton Health Access Initiative, or otherwise known as CHI. Before diving into uh, dried blood spot DBS, I think it's helpful to once again frame the discussion by quickly walking through the testing cascade, which is employed in many um, LMICs, low and middle income countries. Uh, for reference, this cascade is also uh, exhibit one of Chai's recent HCV market intelligence report. The testing begins with individuals uh, having either a rapid test, an RDT, or a lab-based amino assay, which detects the presence of HCV antibodies in blood. Those individuals who test positive are referred for, to, for reflex test, testing with a blood draw that's sent to a centralized facility, typically, um, and this involves a viral load test. Those individuals who uh, test positive for viral load are then put on pangenotypic treatment. And following treatment, 12 weeks later, uh, they are once again have a blood draw for the viral load to assess the sustained viral response at week 12, also known as SVR12. There is currently a reliance on liquid or plasma samples and centralized viral load testing, which can limit the access for some individuals to testing and subsequently treatment. It's important to note that centralized testing of plasma samples is only one of several barriers to scale up of HCV, but it is an important barrier to increasing the access to testing. There's also a recognized need for patient-centered testing, in other words, to bring the test to the patient, not the patient to the testing facility. And there is currently a limited availability of true point-of-care options, which would enable a distributed HCV diagnosis in many low- and middle-income countries. DBS has the opportunity to increase access to testing and treatment, therefore. Through decentralized sample collection via DBS, we can help circumvent the lack of centralized, sorry, decentralized and point of care testing. There are a number of lessons that can be learned and some overlap with the successful implementation of dried blood spots for HIV. And many of these lessons can be applied to expanding DBS for HCV. These opportunities may only be realized, however, if the program is properly supported to handle the sample collection, the transportation, and the results return, which of course would also involve significant funding. There are uh, a number of advantages that DBS has over liquid samples in terms of transportation storage, as well as sample collection. 
uh, while there are, of course, challenges that remain, uh, I'll be going into these advantages in a bit more detail. DBS has fewer transportation and storage constraints than liquid samples. For example, the constraints of liquid samples are that whole blood may only be stored at ambient temperatures for about six hours, or maximum of 24 hours if the whole blood is spun down to plasma using a centrifuge, which requires some level of laboratory infrastructure. Refrigerated plasma must be tested within five to six days, or it otherwise would need to be frozen for longer term storage. Any break in the cold chain or delays in transportation may degrade the, the liquid samples and subsequently make them unfit for testing, requiring new samples to be obtained with potentially significant challenges in relocating those individuals. Liquid samples, therefore, must be transported quickly, which can result in suboptimal transportation from low volume sites. And as an example of this, uh, we can imagine uh, a facility which has a low sample collection frequency. They perhaps only receive a couple of samples per week. And that the pickup of the plasma must still occur on a frequent basis, thereby increasing the per sample transportation cost and burden for low volume sites. So, you know, for example, if a rider can transport 20 samples, but only one sample comes in per week, that one sample still needs to be transported. In contrast, DBS is stable for at least several months at ambient temperature, and some studies have shown this to be stable even for up to a year. And DBS may be transported by just the simple post or a courier without any need for a cold chain. Other potential advantages of DBS in terms of sample collection are around the use of a finger stick, which is less invasive, and no need for venipuncture or therefore a qualified phlebotomist. They also don't need to use a centrifuge to spin down the blood to plasma, which limits the reliance upon so even a low level of laboratory infrastructure. DBS facilitates testing for individuals who may have difficulty providing venous samples for a variety of reasons, and this can include dehydration, uh, illness, or injection drug use. Sample collection by a healthcare worker is actually rather similar to the training needed to administer a rapid test, an RDT, to detect for those who are antibody positive. And this may enable the immediate reflex DBS collection following a positive screening result. So we can imagine a scenario where a number of people have gathered for screening and testing, and uh, those who test positive for antibodies doesn't necessarily mean that they have active viremia. They can immediately be reflex tested for uh, viral load by collecting a DBS sample at that time, then therefore potentially limiting the loss to follow up uh, and or limiting them needing to go someplace else to a testing facility to have a venous blood draw occur. Well, there may be many drivers for uptake, which can vary by country and location. Some of the primary enabling and need-based drivers uh, can include the following. There, the avail availability of a robust postal or courier network can enable DBS to be transported readily. Another enabling factor is the existence of DBS for HIV, which may enable dry blood spot for HCV. This can be uh, imagined by leveraging the HIV DBS sample transport network, also integration of HCV within the HIV DBS work stream is possible. There are some uh, need-based drivers, such as the gaps within an existing liquid sample transportation network. These could be the limited availability of qualified healthcare workers, such as phlebotomists or laboratory staff necessary to store, uh, spin down the samples to plasma, limited facility network coverage, infrequent pickups from remote or just simply low volume, low sample volume sites, where uh, liquid sample transport from certain facilities may not be cost effective due, just simply due to the low volume or the geographic remoteness or a number of other factors. 
or just the overall high cost of liquid sample transportation due to a number of factors, including the need for cold chain storage. There are a, potential, a number of potential market and demonstrated performance knowledge gaps that still need to be addressed and can act as challenges to the implementation on a wide scale of DBS for HCV. For example, an updated assessment of the increased access to HCV testing that would be enabled by DBS could dr help drive uptake. While there is some evidence that DBS can be less expensive than plasma based upon the cost of goods, the lack of cold chain, and a few other factors, it would be valuable to have a broadly applicable cost comparison of DBS to plasma and an assessment of the key drivers of cost both for liquid and dried samples. And finally, a widely accepted performance of DBS for HCV diagnosis and confirmation of cure, SVR12, and this will be enabled by uh, my colleague from FINES, a soon-to-be-published report uh, that will look at global levels of um, DBS performance. In conclusion, there are a number of potential activities which would be needed to implement DBS in LMICs. And these may include uh, publication of independent performance evaluation of HCV DBS, such as the FINE study, soon to be published. Stringent regulatory approval of DBS, which will enable countries to adopt it. Funding to roll out HCV DBS programs. Sensitizing in ministries of health and HCV programs in countries to the opportunities and the challenges of DBS for HCV. And updating country guidance, in-country registrations, performance validations as they are necessary, and a number of other factors that need to occur in country to truly enable the use of HCV for, uh, sorry, DBS for HCV. So in conclusion, although there are remaining potential market and demonstrated performance challenges, there are also a wide range of advantages and opportunities for DBS to increase the access to testing and treatment for hepatitis C. And at this point, I would like to pass it back to the moderators to uh, handle any questions from the audience. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Elisa, Manuel, and Tim for your informative presentations. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is for Elisa. What were some of the challenges that you encountered which the eight with the HCV-C detect program you supported in Spain. Alisa, are you there? You know, we can we can come back to a we can go back to Elisa. Let's go to I have a question for Emmanuel. Um, hi, hi. I'm sorry, I had a problem with the button. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Elisa. Thank you so much. Uh, let me repeat the question for you. What were some of the challenges that you encountered, which the with the HCV C detect program that you supported in Spain? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, we have uh, sometimes the problem of the, the size of the spots. Uh, we need uh, four completely full spots of blood, and sometimes they're not so easy to collect from certain people. So, uh, but usually when insisting to people collecting them that this is an important um, question that, that the spots need to be completely full, uh, it's solved it. So, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Now, Emmanuel, uh, we have a question for you, and this is a two-part question. 
Two-thirds of the sites observed false positives with DBS. Since HCV does not integrate with, into cells like HIV, proviral contamination wouldn't be an issue. Could you comment on potential causes of these false positives? And are there procedural steps that could contribute to this performance? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, yes, that's correct. Uh, two out of the three sites experienced uh, some false positives. Um, I did not include in the presentation that on, upon repeat testing, these uh, DBS results were actually negative. So confirming that they were false positives. And uh, one of the reasons why there could be a potential for cross-contamination in that procedure is when you process the DBS samples. So for example, and also the type of filter paper that you use. So in this study, we use the Watman paper, which needs to be cut, but there are some other filter papers that are actually pre-cut. So you just need to push the filter paper with a, with a tip to detach the, the, the spots from the card. And these, I think uh, this uh, type of card would reduce the potential for cross-contamination. So this is definitely an area. And of course, uh, you know, this SOP to be able to, to process all the DBA samples needs to be followed very properly. So uh, the, these results highlight the importance, you know, of, 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 of adhering to the SOP and also the type of filter paper that you use. I hope that answers your question. That was great. So let's go over to Tim. You discussed number of potential activities which are needed to implement HCV DBS in lower middle income countries. Would you agree that funding to roll out this program seems to be most challenging one to overcome? And do you expect that these programs will continue to be supported nationally rather than by NGOs? Yeah, it's a really good question. And of course, funding is always um, uh, one of the major challenges without funding programs cannot happen. That said, it really depends on a country by country basis. There are a number of countries uh, such as Rwanda that have very significant government budget lines for HCV programs uh, and are on the course toward elimination. And so in these instances, this isn't necessarily a dependence upon global donors that there, there is a lot of uh, funding behind this at the national level. There's also a number of states within nations, such as Punjab, Haryana in India, Nasarawa State in Nigeria, that have specific line items within their state budgets uh, that are funding the HCV programs. Now, Elisa, we'll come back to you. How long can an HCV remain contagious in dried blood on a hard surface or in a needle? Well, uh, in this case, um, according to, to Spanish regulations, um, blood spot or uh, once the, the blood has been dried on a paper, uh, it's, it's not considered uh, really contagious, and especially if it's uh, wrapped up in this uh, plastic bag that we carry them. So that's why they can be shipped through uh, regular postal mail, postal service. But uh, of course, if if you if you're considering needles, like in people who inject drugs, of course, uh, very few uh, um, traces of blood may be still be contagious because they're um, humid or it, it still has some uh, some kind of, of liquid in there. Um, but for for um, dry dry blood, uh, it should be safe. Mm -hmm. So we'll go back over to Emmanuel. Um, Emmanuel, we have another couple part question for you. Um, what was the definition of HCV treatment exposure? And were people on treatment while the study was done or had they already been cured? Yeah, so thanks for the question. So the definition for a HCV treatment group is that any participant uh, uh, attending the clinic, either for SVR12, because he, he, he was scheduled for SVR12, or whether they had already completed treatment. Uh, uh, so uh, that was the definition for the HIV treatment group. So it means that we had patients that had completed treatment uh, several months ago, and, and we did the testing, but also some that came specifically 
for the measurement of SBR12. And then that last. Good. Oh, I'm sorry. Continue. No, no. I hope I hope this uh, clarifies a bit. Sure. And then there was one last question to that one was why would you expect them to have detectable HCV RNA if they had already been treated? Uh, because uh, uh, there could be some treatment failures. Uh, uh, so, for example, you could see that there were patients with high bar loads after being treated. So, of course, they would be uh, classified as treatment failure after being uh, receiving the, the, the regimen with DAAs. And it looks like we might have time for one or two more questions. So this one, again, is for you, Emmanuel. Um, did you say that you needed three finger sticks to properly collect the DBS sample? And what was the acceptability for this in the patients? Yeah, that's correct. The, the number of, because of the number of the different sample types that were collected, you know, if you have the, 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 the finger prick in, in different feet of papers, uh, different finger pricks were necessary. Uh, but in general, uh, the participants did not uh, uh, complain. I mean, there was a high acceptability rate, which is uh, interesting, uh, because I know there's been a lot of the studies uh, uh, discussing about how, how much uh, how many, uh, the participants may not like to participate if you do a lot of finger break. But in, uh, in this study, the acceptability uh, was very high. Great. And it looks like that would be, that is going to be our last question, but we would like to thank you again, Alisa, Emmanuel, and Tim for your time today and for your important research. We would also like to thank Labert and our sponsor, Abbott Molecular Global Scientific Affairs for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions questions that we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact by the speakers excuse me via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration this webcast can be viewed on demand labroots will alert you via email when it's available for replay we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event that's all for now thank you for joining us and until next time goodbye